uh, we're, we're, it's a pleasure to have Linda Thomas Fowler here tonight. She's, of course, one of our own Novak members. And, uh, you know, what can I say about Linda? She's a terrific person, but she's an outstanding astrophotographer. I mean, I, like I said earlier, she, she can put her work against anyone that, uh, not only in our club, but anywhere. Um, it's really, it's a, it's really amazing, beautiful work she does. And, um, she's climbed the hill, you know, it's not easy to do astrophotography. Um, and there's all forms of it out there. Um, and she's managed to accomplish what, what I would love to say that I could do one of these years before I lose my, my eyesight entirely. Um, so it's, it, she's, she does impressive work. Um, she, not only that, but she has her own YouTube channel. And I think someone posted a, a link to that in the chat called Linda's Astronomy Adventures. And uh, she's a contributor to Astrobin and does some, some work for them. And she's been featured on uh, Fraser Kane's uh, virtual astronomy um, um, chats. And I think that's uh, part of the uh, podcast, uh, right, Linda, the uh, astronomy cast. Not not the Astronomy no. Cast podcast. Okay. They do a virtual star party. Um, ah, okay. They've been uh, clouded out pretty much across the okay. entire country for the past month. But yeah, well, I know Fraser has that podcast, which I listen yeah. to quite a bit too. So, um, in addition to that, she does have a real job and a real life outside of astrophotography. But uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to have you tonight, and thank you for taking our invite on uh, on uh, Valentine's Day. So. I'll turn it over to you, Linda, uh, to kind of share your experiences in that journey. Thanks, Paul. Um, I, uh, I I think Paul's overstating my uh, ability by you know a couple orders of magnitude, but uh, uh, my ego will take. It. <laughs> um, let me uh, share my screen and. All right, so uh, can you see my uh, presentation, Paul? Yep, looks good. All right, so everybody has to start out as a beginner in astrophotography, right? These are, are not skills that we're all born with. And uh, so this is I have basically kind of a, a documenting my own journey, a continuing journey through imaging. Um, it's uh, by no means am I an expert. Um, I'm, every single image teaches me something new. Um, but it is one of the most challenging things I've ever tried to do. And as Paul mentioned, the learning curve can be pretty steep and pretty slippery. Um, so this isn't going to be a technical talk. This isn't going to talk about you know, how you set up a mount for astrophotography or how you you process things in PixInsight or Photoshop, but it's going to talk about the challenges that I um, that I faced along the way and how I overcame them. So, um, if anybody has any questions, please just pop them in the chat, and Paul, you can interrupt at an appropriate point whenever you whenever you think makes sense. Um, with that, um, why, as amateurs, do any of us do astronomy? There's got to be a lot of different reasons, but for me, it expands my mind and it connects me to things so far, so far beyond the conventional of day-to-day -day life that it keeps me connected to that sense of wonder that we had as children. So for me, science in general and astronomy in particular helped keep me young at heart. Astronomy has been a fascination of mine for as long as I can remember in the long list of childhood declarations about the job I wanted when I grew up, astronaut and astronomer were at the top of my list. Sadly, I listened to others and never pursued either of those, but my love of astronomy and my love of learning about the universe never left me. When I was around 12, a neighbor knowing my interest and anyone who was near me for more than a millisecond really couldn't help knowing, gave me a small refractor. I think it was a 60 millimeter Tasco and I was just thrilled. But I was also soon disappointed. The rickety mount was really hard to point. I lived just outside of Baltimore and could barely see any stars. 
I was able to view the moon, but that was the extent of what I could ever see with that telescope. But even so, you know, for as a 12 year old to be able to see the moon up close was just wonderful. Eventually, I went to college to study computer science, and ultimately, I entered the job market. And one year, I was lucky enough to receive a bonus at work and decided I was going to buy a real telescope. After a lot of research, I opted for a C8. And around the same time, I was able to connect with Novak, and the wonderful people in the club helped me learn how to use it. I still remember the thrill of seeing Jupiter and Saturn for the first time. M13 was the first deep sky object I found on my own. I spent as much time as I could under the stars, but in practice, that wasn't very much. One or two nights a month was all I managed. At the same time, photography had always been an interest, and I was keen to combine these interests. But this was still the days of film, and the technical and financial challenges to astrophotography back then exceeded both my time and my budget. But I was content and happy to be a visual observer. Then I moved away from the area, only briefly as it turned out, but that disrupted my astronomy for years. Then the 2017 eclipse happened. At first, I didn't think my work schedule would permit me to travel to the eclipse, but two weeks before it happened, I realized I would be able to travel. Thankfully, friends in Asheville, North Carolina, live close to the path of totality, and their enthusiastic support along with an incredible spouse who was willing to indulge my obsession, combined to make for an amazing experience. I wanted to try to photograph the eclipse, but I also didn't want to be tied to the camera while it was happening. The application solar eclipse maestro came to the rescue. We traveled to Greenville, South Carolina for the eclipse, and thankfully were treated to perfect weather. Nine of us set up at an apartment complex where one of us lived. We spent the day viewing the eclipse, giving views to other residents, eating lots of food, and generally having a great time. When it was done, I had photos. Many people had had their first total eclipse experience, and the day was a complete success. It wasn't perfect. My daytime polar alignment wasn't great, and I had to keep recentering the sun. It was actually pretty tough to tell through the viewfinder how centered the sun was. So most of the images are a little bit off center, but I was thrilled to get any kind of a usable result, especially on such short notice. This was kind of like lighting a match to a powder keg. The urge to dive into astrophotography was back. And with the improvement in technology in the intervening years, it looked like it might be more accessible than ever. I spent the next several months reading about imaging and equipment and deciding on what to do. I knew the C8 that I had would be a terrible choice to start with. Eventually I bought some equipment. The first piece to come in was the mount. I went out to Camp High Road and decided to do a wide field shot using my DSLR as uh, the camera and telescope and Orion was my target. It was very cold, it was 26 degrees. Polar alignment with the new mount was challenging. It took me nearly an hour, but eventually it was good enough. I was using Sequence Generator Pro for acquisition and I couldn't get it to plate solve my images. Plate solving is getting the software to take a picture of the sky, uh, figure out where it's actually pointing and then correct the mount's idea of where it's actually pointing. But I didn't get that to work, so I ended up living with the off-center framing that, I, that the mount gave me. I started the imaging run, and I was thrilled to see that I could see M42 and even just barely see the Horsehead Nebula. With an unmodified DSLR, I really wasn't expecting to see the Horsehead, but it was there, and suddenly the cold felt less intrusive. I let it run a bit over 30 minutes until the camera battery died. A fully charged battery that normally lasts hours was depleted in less than a single hour in the cold. Though I had another battery, I decided to pack up and see what I had achieved. That 26 degree temperature had continued to drop and my horsehead euphoria had started to wear off. I had already taken bias frames at home and had planned to take darks at Camp High Road, but the early battery death put an end to that. So I got darks outside the next night 
and it was still quite cold. I tried to take flats using my computer screen, but as it turned out, my flats were not very good. For those that don't know, bias, darks, and flats are used to calibrate your images. And they're kind of the, the foundation of all the work you do before you actually stack your image together. But I, I struggled through all of that and used PixInsight, the program that I had bought to do image processing, and I got an image. I was excited again. There be nebulae here. But what was that gray arc in the bottom? You might not be able to see it on your screen, but it runs right through here. It kind of looked like it was in the right spot for Barnard's loop, but I really thought it might be an artifact of some sort. People came down about equally on both possibilities. It wasn't until two years later that I actually realized my flats were bad and they created this artifact. If you look closely at the image, although it's probably too small at this scale, you can see all the defects of my zoom lens. There was a tremendous amount wrong with this image, but it was my first non-eclipse tracked image, and I was thrilled. I also had lots of problems to solve. My next image was taken from home. It had been a month since we'd had a clear night, and it had also been really, really cold. Things were going a little bit better. Polar alignment went more quickly. Plate solving worked. I was still using the DSLR at this time at 200 millimeters and riding on the mount. So this was still all unguided, the simplest kind of tracked imaging. What I didn't count on was M45 setting behind the neighbor's house fairly quickly. At least my camera battery lasted through the session. This wasn't spectacular, but at the time, to use a word that will quickly become overused in this presentation, I was thrilled. The weather was still failing to cooperate, and it wasn't until May that I could try again. I chose M81 and M82, though they were small for my field of view, but I could see them from home. Um, home had very, very challenging horizons between trees and houses. Uh, this would be a few, excuse me, this would be a frequent theme for when I was imaging at home. My fairly narrow view of the sky would limit my choice of target. But by imaging at home, I was able to set up quickly and, you know, work through all of the problems and then go inside where it was warm. This was all still the same equipment that I was using on the last image, but this time I was able to get three and uh, three point three hours. My processing on this isn't great, and there isn't a lot of detail, but I was, wait for it, thrilled. You can still actually recognize M81 and M82 for what they are. So I was happy. As I said, I decided to limit most of my imaging to home right now. Even though home was in a Bortle 7 sky, I was living in Ashburn, and I had very limited horizons. I could set up in 15 minutes and then stay comfortable in the house. And given the steep learning curve I was experience, experiencing, it seemed the least frustrating way to go. The weather was also terrible through the winter of 2018. I was averaging one night a month and it was hard to make process, progress, excuse me, but I was determined to get there. By NEF in 2018, I was ready to purchase a small refractor and a guide scope and a guide camera. Unfortunately, the guide camera was back ordered, but by June, it had come in. Still imaging from my backyard, I was limited in target choice. I opted for M57, even though it was tiny in my field of view, because I really didn't expect to get anything usable. And this was a familiar friend that would really help in evaluating the results. Uh, the, uh, the telescope that I was using at this point was an 80 millimeter F6 refractor. I was now trying to get guiding to work and I just, couldn't make it work. The guiding program, PhD, runs a calibration sequence and it was yelling at me and telling me it was not working and I couldn't figure out how to get it to behave. So I just let it run and I was actually able to get this image. Um, and I, I was still pretty happy with how this came out. Uh, but guiding was going to become the bane of my existence for the next 18 months. So many people tried to help me with my guiding problems. 
uh, a lot of people in Novak and on the Cloudy Nights forum were really generous in their time. Uh, Chow, I'm talking to you. And uh, eventually thinking it might be cable related because of the uh, heavy DSLR and the, the cables coming off that, I decided to purchase an ASI 294 MC Pro camera, which is a one-shot color dedicated astronomy camera. I would never actually planned to buy one of these, but I didn't have budget for a mono camera with the filter wheel and filters. And I was really hoping this would solve my guiding problems, which I was thinking were cable related, but it didn't. The new camera was amazing in its sensitivity though. It gave me another new thing to learn how to control. And in this image, I actually severely clipped a lot of stars, but the detail on M27 was just amazing. My next three images, the North American Nebula, M31, and the Heart Nebula, each taught me something. Processing each of them was hard, really hard. Hard enough that I knew I wasn't getting everything out of them that I wanted to. Through all of this, I was fighting with the guiding on my mount. I was convinced the problem was the operator and I was determined to figure it out. But by April of 2019, I was coming to the conclusion that my guiding issues were really mount issues. The mount had already been back to Las Mandy for them to look at, but it hadn't made any real difference. And I was starting to read similar reports of problems from other users with that mount model. Someone on the Cloudy Night forum was able to give me some useful suggestions and it helped, but it, it really wasn't perfect. But by this point, I had put the budget together for a mono camera and some LRGB filters and a filter wheel. I selected the ASI 1600mm Pro, and uh, that's a really popular first camera for people doing mono imaging. And this was the first image with it, Mark Harian's chain and M87. I also at the same time splurged and bought an electronic focuser. I often didn't wake up to check and correct focus drift, and so I would lose a lot of the later sub-exposures during the night if the temperature dropped much. Now with the electronic focuser, I was only losing frames to egg-shaped stars from guiding issues and not to fuzzy out-of-focus stars. Unfortunately, that was still a lot of frames. This was only four hours, but I was just thrilled with what was there. I was curious whether that little 80 millimeter telescope could see a quasar. This was from a Bortle 7 sky and only four hours of integration and I was expecting the answer to be a resounding no. But as it turned out, there are eight or nine circles on here that mark known quasars that have faint dots in them. Turns out you can look back more than a billion years ago with just an 80 millimeter refractor in really light polluted skies. You're only gonna see a dot, but it's a billion year old dot. This was the image that finally brought me to the limits of my patience with the mount. I was getting barely acceptable performance and I was losing about 50% of my sub exposures due to stars being out around. Plus I was losing lots of sky time due to dither settling because the mount just wasn't behaving well. My images were improving, but it took me three nights to get three and a half hours of usable data. And this just wasn't very productive. Ultimately I decided life was too short to fight with the mount and sold it and purchased a Skywatcher EQ6R Pro. My first image with the new mount was IC1318 in Cygnus. This was 10 hours of data because for the first time, I could actually get that much data without worrying about the impending heat death of the universe occurring first. The mount was behaving. It wasn't gonna perform like an astrophysics or a paramount or one of those other high-end mounts, but I was getting good results and suddenly my image quality really jumped up. This taught me a hugely important lesson Integration time matters, and it matters a lot. The image was easier to process, and the final results were a lot better. The hardest part about this image was dealing with the ASI 1600 sensor reflection around the star solder over here. I felt like my image quality took a huge step up with this image, and I was really looking forward to the Almost Heaven Star Party. Suddenly life was cooperating. At AHSP, I was only able to get 90 minutes on M16 before it set, but I was amazed that this was better than eight hours at home. 
During a nice stretch of cooperating weather in September and October 2019, I was able to do several images, and with each one, my confidence increased. Image processing was still challenging, and I have this tendency to try to push the data a little bit harder than it really wanted to be pushed. But that ended up teaching me a lot about the limits of the data, even if it made me want to pull my hair out at times. My images weren't perfect. Even with my terrestrial images, I can always see the flaws more than I can see the good parts. But I was finally getting images that I was proud of, and I was no longer spending a lot of time fighting with the equipment. This crescent was done entirely from home and from Camp High Road, while the elephant trunk and propeller were a mix of from HSP and home. The crescent was hard to process. Most people don't really even attempt the crescent in RGB, and I really tried to push the data as hard as I could. I wanted to see if an RGB image could get the kind of detail that narrowband images were getting. The answer was no, but it was still kind of amazing to see what I could get. This definitely pushed the data harder than was wise, but it was a really fun experiment. The others are also more typically narrowband targets, but I didn't have narrowband filters yet. So it was dive in and see what I could get. I was pretty happy with how both of those came out. The Pelican, Eastern Vale, and IC5068 round out the images from this fantastic stretch of good weather. Each one brought me a little more confidence in processing and I really felt like I was starting to get the hang of this. My last image from that stretch of good weather was the Cocoon Nebula. This was a bit over eight hours. And with this image, I finally felt like I had the basics down and could concentrate more on processing skills than on acquisition skills. Buying the new mount had set my budget back a little bit but I was finally ready to purchase narrowband filters. The only problem was narrowband filters weren't ready to be purchased. They were out of stock. Eventually the S2 and O3 filters came in, but the hydrogen alpha filter was remaining stubbornly out of reach. But by January, 2020, the hydrogen alpha filter had arrived and the rosette was my first narrowband target. When the first hydrogen alpha exposure came in, I had to pick my jaw up off the floor. The detail was incredible. I knew narrowband would be a game changer, but it wasn't clear to me beforehand just how much it would be that. This was 14 hours of data, and I chose to process it in a non-standard palette because it matched this vision in my head of how I wanted it to look. Adam Block, a well-known imager, um, says that each image should tell a story. And for me, the story here was energy and danger. I'm not really sure why the rosette triggered that in me, but from that first sub, that's what was in my head. Uh, maybe it was a passing resemblance to the Eye of Sauron from the Lord of the Rings. I don't know, your mileage may vary on what you see here, but that's what it looked like to me. And, and using this palette kind of brought that energy and danger to mind, at least for me. The next thing I wanted to try was combining hydrogen alpha with an RGB image. M33 was the target there. I had 21 hours of data, and it turns out that combining hydrogen alpha and RGB was actually pretty hard. Eventually I settled on this, which makes the Nebulian M33 much more noticeable than they were in the RGB only image. Again, I tried to pull as much detail out of this as I could, and I might have pushed it just a little bit too far. I'm still not 100% happy with the way I did the combination, but overall, excuse me, I was pretty happy with the way this came out. I felt like I was kind of flying high from my recent successes, and I decided to stretch myself and came crashing back down to Earth. Uh, when Comet C2017 T2 pan stars came through. I set up to try to uh, image that based on some uh, presentation that Bob Traub and the club had given to the imaging group. And when I tried to do it, I just, I couldn't make it work. It turns out that the comet just wasn't moving enough from frame to frame for me to get enough data uh, to be able to combine it the way it needed to be combined. So instead, I made this animation and it's hard to see in this small image, but the comet is slowly moving in the frame from here down to here. 
that was the best I could pull out of this. This would have been a little bit easier to do with the one shot color camera than the, the mono camera, but I was planning on doing some other imaging on uh, DSO in the same night. So I didn't want to change cameras. The next image was back to narrowband. This was the sole nebula in an SOH palette, which means that I put the sulfur in red, the oxygen in green, and the hydrogen in blue. I was really enjoying seeing the different ways that combining narrowband data could create very different feelings in the viewer. This was a deliberate choice of trying to evoke a particular feeling. The Sol Nebula may get its name just because it's in close proximity to the Heart Nebula, uh, but I wanted to process the data because of the name, the Sol Nebula. To me, the soul was a somewhat ethereal concept, and this color combination evoked that, evoked that ethereal feeling for me. It wasn't until later that I saw a baby rhinoceros in the image, sort of, which might kind of spoil the ethereal effect. Either way, I really love the way this image came out. This time we're back to HARGB, this time on M81 and 82. I really wanted to see what the hydrogen alpha could do on M82 in its starburst region. And the answer was a lot. Doing the combine again was hard, but I was really stoked to see what this 80, little 80 millimeter telescope could pull out in detail on these targets. In uh, April 2020, I started working on the LEO triplet and I finally gave up in June because it was setting behind a tree in the neighbor's yard at sunset. I'd actually planned to get eight hours per filter and to simplify the processing workflow, I thought I'd just go get all the green, then all the blue, then all the red. However, the weather had other ideas. But by June, I was running out of time. I had lots of green, but only a little over an hour of red and less than an hour of blue and then it was gone. So I decided to process it to see what I could get. And it turned out not too bad, but I definitely wanna add more time to this in the future. In 2018, I did the Western Veil down here in the left-hand corner. And well, to put it kindly, it was bad. I didn't have a lot of data. I really, really pushed it too hard and it just, it, it suffered badly. In the summer of 2020, I started collecting narrow band data for it. I had a fair amount of H alpha and O3, but I didn't have enough S2 yet. So I decided to go ahead and process the hydrogen oxygen as an HOO image. So hydrogen in red and oxygen doubled in green and blue, which kind of approximates the, the natural colors. And I was just blown away by how much better this result was. That's this image here in the center. Uh, eventually, I had enough sulfur data, and I did an HOS version, so hydrogen in red, oxygen in blue, and sulfur in green. And though it had a very different feel, I was really, really happy with the way it turned out. In the, uh, in the top image, I was kind of emphasizing the uh, Western veil here. In the bottom image, I was actually kind of more focused on Pickering's triangle, so that's why I changed the framing here. One of the few good things to come out of this whole COVID lockdown was the possibility for my spouse to work from home, something that our company had never allowed before. We decided that we could actually move out to darker skies, but we were also constrained in that we needed good internet so that we could both work remotely. That search proved a lot more challenging than we expected. And it was only in September that we found a place to make an offer on. We actually had to compromise on the sky a little bit. It's only Bortle 4, but that's a lot better than the Bortle 7 that we were in. And we still have good internet. And the goal was to build an observatory there, which is now here. Uh, at the same time, uh, just after actually we made that offer, I was invited to participate in a remote observatory in West Virginia in even darker skies than I was moving to. We had actually considered moving out to this area, but decided it was just a little bit too remote. Still, while we were slowly packing up the old house and I would never have been able to find time to image at home, 
the remote access let me get images like this RGB Pac-Man from West Virginia. The move happened at the end of November, and this image of LBN 581 uh, was done with equipment in West Virginia. Uh, this is a relatively rarely imaged nebula, and that's a bit of a shame because it's large, and the hydrogen alpha is really quite a strong signal and very detailed, though the hydrogen oxygen is fairly weak. So a kind of a funny thing happened along the way to getting to where I am now. Uh, a couple of years, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, I guess, about a year and a half at this point, uh, Kevin, who runs the imaging subgroup for Novak, had asked me to do a presentation at the imaging group. And most people did them live on their laptops, but I didn't have a laptop. So I did it uh, by making a video and playing the video there at the presentation. Someone at the group asked me if it would be available online, which I hadn't even thought about. And so I ended up making a YouTube channel for it just so I could share it with, with the group. And then someone else in the imaging group asked a question about processing that I tried to answer through email. And I, I just couldn't get the point across in the email, so I made another video. And then suddenly another and another and another. And for a while, they were coming out about once a month. Um, eventually, the house search really slowed things down, though. And I'm definitely not an expert, and there are a lot of people who are better imagers than I am. But I found that doing those videos actually helps me improve, and hopefully it pays it forward in some small way, because the amount of support that I've gotten from the group has just been amazing. Um, on the photo sharing site, Astrobin, I ended up creating a group for Novak to be able to share images. And then I also created another group for women astrophotographers. And that group led Fraser Kane, the publisher of Universe Today, to invite me to participate in his virtual star parties that get streamed on YouTube. That's really been a lot of fun. Oops. So what have I learned along the way? Like I said in the beginning, astrophotography is challenging. It's a lot easier than it was back in the days of film and manual guiding. I, I'd say it's gone from the practically impossible to the merely, really, really, really hard. If you approach this, you need to expect failure along the way. The learning curve is sleep, steep and slippery. Equipment's finicky, failure lurks around every corner, and everything has to work nearly perfect to get a usable image. I educated myself as best I could, and I really felt prepared, and it still took me 18 months to feel like I was getting somewhere. I got advice in the beginning to start with a small refractor, and that was great advice. I'm glad I followed it. I'm still using that refractor today. Um, while it turns out I had a lemon of amount, I'm not going to entirely blame the manufacturer. I really probably should have started with an EQ6R or something similar. I thought I knew more than I knew and that I could skip some steps. And it turns out I couldn't. A lot of people have had some great success with that manufacturer. I'm not going to bash them, but my mount wasn't their best effort. And though they tried to make it right, I eventually lost patience with it. Um, but when I ran into problems, because I, I didn't really know whether they were mount problems or my problems, A lot of people say the mount is the most important piece of equipment in imaging, more so than the computer or the uh, telescope or the uh, a camera. And I agree because the mount's the foundation of everything that you do. If your mount doesn't work, nothing works. And I'm living proof of that. But I'd say an electronic focuser is probably the second most important focus, uh, component. Keeping good focus through the night is critical. And if you wanna sleep while your imaging is running, then your electronic focuser is, is not suggested equipment, it's a requirement. The other thing that really helps is to surround yourself with smart people. Between the people here on Novak and in the imaging forum on cloudy nights, I had a lot of help. 
I may not have succeeded without their help. The camaraderie and the depth of knowledge in uh, the Novak group is just incredible. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you all for all of the help you've given me over the last couple of years. <clears throat> As beginners, we're all thrilled pretty much to get anything. Those hour long integrations seem magical, but they're actually harder to process than a four, five, six, seven, eight hour integration. The more light polluted your skies are, the more time you need. In the beginning, we tend to ignore that because we haven't seen firsthand how important it is. Or like me, other issues keep you from getting more time. But spend some time getting eight hours on one target and you'll see the difference. And to get that time, you need to get repeatable framing from night to night, which means that you need to get plate solving working. Don't skip it, do it, do it early. It'll make your life easier and you'll wonder why you didn't do it earlier. Thankfully, there are some new plate solving packages like ASTAP that are a lot easier to set up than the earlier packages were. The other thing is dither. Dither is a small random movement that your mount makes. And what this does is it gets rid of non-uniform pattern noise in your sensor when you stack and it'll make your images better. You might be dithering now, but you probably need to dither a larger amount than you think you do, um, especially if you're using a one-shot color camera. Uh, the downside is larger dithers require a little more settling time, but it's worth it because it'll make your image less noisy when you actually do your stack. It's also really easy to overlook how much of a difference narrowband makes. Uh, obviously, people get told narrowband is, is your savior, especially if you live in light polluted skies. But especially for one shot color users, it may be harder to, to, uh, to try to do narrow band. Fortunately, there are a lot of those dual tri and quad band filters that you can use with one shot color these days. I actually don't have any personal experience with one, but a lot of people are using them to great effect. And for emission nebula, they're a great way to help cut through the light pollution. If you've got a DSLR or mirrorless camera, they're a great way to ease the cost of entry into imaging. But those astro cameras with their fixed point temperature controls really make life easy. And um, you know, if you're using an unmodified DSLR, they really help capture the uh, uh, hydrogen alpha part of the signal a lot better. So that's kind of the overview of my last couple of years. Like I said, not a technical presentation, more of kind of a what it felt like to be Linda for the last couple of years and beat your head against the wall fighting with the mount. It was, like I said, some of the most challenging and frustrating stuff I've done, especially in the beginning, but it was really rewarding. And uh, I, I think Paul said at the beginning, you know, why, why do we do this stuff? And I, I think part of it is, for, one is the challenge of getting to see things with the camera that we don't get to see with our own eyes. Um, I love visual observing, but I can't see the things that I see in a picture with my eyes. So for me, that's part of what draws me to the to imaging. And the other part is, is maybe that it is hard and, and that it's rewarding to be able to get something that, you know, maybe not a lot of people are doing. And for me, I, I really do enjoy putting in the effort to do that. So thanks for your time and attention. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Yeah, super. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, um, let's see, we have a couple questions in the chat room. I know I've got a whole list I've been <laughs> writing down. I won't <laughs> bore you with those, most of them. But uh, let's go to, uh, let me see here. Tom, do you want to ask your question? Um, uh, I can if you're not, but I, I want to turn it over to Tom Peak. Um, it might be it might be easier. He was he was wondering what software uh, do you suggest beginners use, and I'm assuming he's meaning the you know on the processing end. But maybe you could talk about all the different software packages you use. 
Sure. Um, I, I've actually used three different packages for acquisition, Sequence Generator Pro, Nina, and Voyager. And I love Nina. It's uh, open source software, so it's free to download and use. And it's really incredibly capable. It's fairly easy to set up and it works really, really well. Um, so for acquisition, I would definitely recommend Nina. Um, and I think there are a bunch of people in the club using it now, so there's a lot of support out there. For image processing, um, Pix Insights probably the, the big piece of software that most people use, but there's also a piece of software called Astro Pixel Processor that's quite good. Um, it's not as capable as Pix Insight. It's maybe a little bit easier to use for easier, you know, for smaller projects, but I think for, for larger projects, Pix Insight's actually a little bit easier. Um, but uh, those are probably the two big. And of course, there are a lot of people still doing image processing in Photoshop, although they have to do their stacking somewhere else. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nick, uh, you're up. Do you wanna do you wanna ask your question? Uh, Nick is interested, Linda, in just the, the make and model of your of your current setup, your refractor. Sure. Uh, the refractor is a Stellar View SV80, uh, which is a, a, a 80 millimeter f6 ref, uh, apochromatic refractor, um, and the focuser is the Moonlight Nightcrawler, which was uh, a, a splurge. But I love that focuser. It, it's both the focuser and rotator combined, so it helps me frame the image the way I want. Um, and um, then uh, using Astrodon filters for LRGB and narrowband and uh, ZWO ASI 1600 for a camera. Okay. I know, I noticed there's a lot of vendors in that sort of 80 to 100 millimeter range refractor. How did you decide on what you chose versus the other ones? Is it, you think there's a big quality difference or is that what? Um, there are a lot of people in the club who are using Stellar View refractors that were speaking very highly of them. Um, and I, I can say the support from Stellar View has been first class whenever I've had a question for them. Um, like when I wanted to get the electronic focuser, the question was how to mate that up with the telescope and the support from Stellar View and from Moonlight working together to figure out how to make that happen. I cannot say enough good things about either company. Um, so uh, the reason that I went with Stellar View was their reputation. They weren't necessarily the cheapest out there, but um, mm -hmm. I'm definitely happy I went with them. Okay. Kevin Hosleg, you want to ask your question? See, I know the mute button is hard to find. I know that. Uh, Kevin wants to know, um, are you using a fixed peer for your polar alignment or how does that work with your setup? No, uh, well, okay, right now, I'm, my telescope is piggybacked on another telescope in West Virginia, so I'm not having to worry about polar alignment. But prior to that, so up until a few months ago, I was always having to set up each time and so I was using uh, SharpCap for polar alignment, which is a fantastic uh, package that most people are using for uh, real-time stacking and real-time image acquisition. For me, I was just using its really excellent polar alignment module. Okay, Charlie um, wants to know which narrowband filters are you using? Maybe you mentioned that, but uh, so what, what do you have? I chose the uh, three nanometer Astrodon or Astrodon filters, um, and I, I was originally planning to get a five nanometer hydrogen alpha because that would also in include the uh, I think the nitrogen signal, but uh, as it turned out, it, the 
just wasn't coming in stock and wasn't coming in stock and they had the three nanometer. So I went for that. Um, I definitely recommend going uh, three nanometer for oxygen, if nothing else, because you're going to have more light pollution slip through in oxygen. Um, maybe not quite as important for sulfur and hydrogen alpha, but uh, for oxygen, definitely. Now, did you, I forget if you said it, I uh, apologize. Did you start with a one-shot color or you went basically to the narrow? Yeah, no, I started with a one-shot color and I never actually intended to, but uh, I thought my mount problems were actually ah. caused by the cables on my DSLR because it was, you know, a big, heavy DSLR and, uh, you know, had two cables coming off the back of it. And um, I thought maybe that was just causing the mount to to have issues. It, it turned out it wasn't, but uh, the one-shot color camera is still fun to use, but it's not my primary thing anymore. Okay. Uh, let's see, we have a few more here. Alistair? McKechnie? Yeah, Alistair was mentioning uh, KSTARS and ACOS, which is another open source software package. Okay. I'm just reading through some of these. Um, you did mention dither, and I'm interested in when you said dither, I think you said larger. Did you mean, do you mean a bigger range of motion or did you mean dither every frame or what did what did you mean there? So so the number of frame, every, frames that you dither is probably going to mostly depend on how long your exposures are. So if you're taking five minute narrowband exposures, you probably want to dither every frame. But if you're doing 30 second RGB exposures, then you can probably get away with dithering every two or three frames. Um, but really what I was referring to was the amount that you dither. Okay. And so if you're using a one-shot color camera, um, you probably want to be dithering like eight or nine uh, pixels on your main imaging camera. So translate that into the number of pixels for your guide camera, which is a bit of a, a math exercise. But um, if you're using mono cameras, you don't need to dither quite as much as you do for, for one-shot color. Because for one-shot color, you're doing that interpolation uh, with the Bayer matrix. And so you kind of need to move a bit more to ensure that your pattern noise gets spread out further. OK. Uh, let's see. There are some great posts about that by John Rista on the Cloudy Nights forum. If, if you search for his name and dithering, you probably find it. OK. Let's see a few more here. Uh, best mount and filter wheel for an 80 millimeter refractor. Well, I'm definitely a fan of the EQ6R. The only downside is it's heavy. Um, but if you can lift 45 pounds and, and move it around, it's it's a great price performance mount. Um, the uh, A lot of people are having success with uh, the, the newer small Ioptron CEM 45, I think it is. Um, I don't have any direct experience with them. I know there are a couple people in the club using CEM 60s that seem to like them. Um, uh, I don't have a lot of experience with other mounts, so I, I not a lot of recommendations I can make. I know Chris is using, uh, Chris Kage is using an AVX, which is probably the least recommended starting mount, but <laughs> and he's nodding his head vigorously. <laughs> Yep, um, and I'm coming to understand why. Yeah, it's <laughs> um, one of the things that if you're going to do imaging, it, especially on the mount, it pays not to start with the really low end equipment, but kind of go to the mid range stuff um, because the lower range mounts tend not to have very good deck movements. They tend to have a lot of stiction in their deck. And so when you ask them to guide or to dither in declination, they don't move very nicely. And that just makes life miserable. Um, and so starting with uh, something in, in the mid range will actually make your life a lot less, less frustrating. I tried to go to the upper mid range and got slapped down, but... <laughs> 
Um, you know, I, I don't know why I had so many problems with that mount, but I'm glad I don't have them anymore. Yeah, Chris and I both have the AVX, which are, which I'm I'm learning to to live with. It's I mean, but but it, I can, often I often ignore. I only dither in right ascension for the reasons you right. Put, you know, it's, it's like you're covering the. And the I'm <laughs> downsizing the scope that I'm using on it because I'm having trouble settling after dither, or so on and so forth. So I'm trying to shed weight. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I'm also trying to shed weight, but I can do it on the telescope easier. <laughs> And, yes. and <laughs> with the with the eq6r you know there are people imaging on that mount with 127 millimeter refractors so it's a mount that can grow with you um i, I wouldn't want to use it in a remote observatory but you know if you're if you're there with the mount it's a terrific choice you think that's a good upgrade path then for chris and i and all the other avx users yeah i i do Okay. Uh, Michael, Michael Lewis, did you want to ask about, uh, let's see, you had some questions here. Um, uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, that was a good presentation, Ms. Thomas Fuller. I appreciate that. Um, I am not set up for astrophotography at all. Uh, and Dark Sky Week is coming up in April. I wanted to take a photo of the night sky to post on social media. Um, I was wondering, do you have any tips for, for very beginners who just like to take a few shots? Sure. Um, I, I assume you've got a, a DSLR or something like that? I'm, I, I'm not even to that level yet. I mean, I mean, just to like take regular pictures, you've got a camera? Uh, I, I have a cell phone. Okay. So, um, if you have an app on your cell phone that'll let you take a long exposure, like some of the some of the phones have a, 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 a live or, or sorry a long exposure mode, um, put your camera on uh, some kind of tripod and take a thirty second wide angle exposure, pointing it at this part of the sky where the Milky Way is, and you'll get something recognizable. Thank you very much. The, the wider you go, the less precise you need to be. So, um, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking through. I think we covered most of the questions. So, if folks want to just uh, jump in here with open mics, and we're kind of at the top of the hour, just a little bit over, but uh, um, we'll uh, we'll hang hang on here as long as. Linda has time to field questions. Um, yeah, John posted in the chat about he's read that the EQ6R is the best mount under 2000. And a lot of times it can be a lot less under 2000. They, they do sales a few times a year where you can get it around 1300. So um, I, I was fortunate enough to, to uh, that that's kind of what pushed me over the edge toward buying it was uh, they, I saw the sale and it's like, you know what, I just, for the sake of my own sanity, I need to try this. <laughs> yeah. Where did you get it from? Did you get it from like OPT or High Point or? High Point in my case. Okay. They all seem to go along the same lines. They're all priced the same and the sales are all this and pretty much the same. So it's whoever has it, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, um, my, uh, my telescope I actually got from High Point at Neef in 2018. Um, they bought up all the stock from the vendors there. So I got it for less than a new telescope, but with a new warranty. And it was actually the uh, the first telescope that Stellarview made of that particular model. So uh, it, it's actually a little bit of a telescope with a history, which is kind of fun. What targets are you going after next, Linda? Um, so I have, have two that I'm working on. One is a redo of the Pleiades M45 um, that uh, I'm doing uh, with the telescope out in West Virginia. I've got about 10 hours in on that and I'm hoping for more, but the weather just hasn't been cooperating, uh, maybe 12 hours. 
Um, and then the other thing I'm working on is the cone nebula in narrowband. If we ever get to open the roof out there. Uh, there was a, a question about resources. So there's a book that I would recommend called The Deep Sky Imaging Primer by, uh, the author's name is escaping me at the moment. Um, there's it's the second edition of that book is the one that you want. It'll take you through everything from equipment selection through processing. And I'm not really a fan of those style of book in general. A lot of them um, kind of do lip service to the subjects that they're they're doing and don't really take you into the details of it. But this book is fantastic and it's incredibly accessible. It's one of the best written how-to books I've ever seen. <clears throat> uh, one I, one I question I wanted to ask about was was your the flats. Do do you, you used to use your computer monitor, which is still what I use, but I'm sure that's not the proper uh, equipment. Do you have a flat box now or some type of? Yeah, I, I ended up buying one of those. I, first, I tried those LED tracing panels off of Amazon. And a lot of people have good luck with them. But for some, I tried two of them. But in my case, I could see that they weren't uh, linear across the panel, or they weren't, uh, sorry, uniform across the panel. And so I decided you could fight that by kind of just rotating it every couple of exposures and averaging out the, the non-uniformity, but that was just kind of a pain in the butt. So I ended up buying one of those electroluminescent panels off the internet and then putting it in a picture frame with a, a, um, a, uh, 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 Sorry, blanking in the word. Oh, with, glass with, or yeah, yeah, I, with a diffuser in front of it. Let me find the uh, the link for that, and I'll post it in the chat. Um, because they weren't hard to build, and they weren't expensive to build. And I am like the least competent person when it comes to mechanical stuff. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. That's the link to how you're I, getting good results from that. Okay. okay. Yeah, it, it works great. Um, nice. And you just set it on top of the telescope and shoot your flats, and it does its thing. It's not if you're using a one-shot color camera, your your peaks are not going to line up because it's not white. It, they tend to be bluish, but it still works fine. Okay. Just kind of instead of exposing for the peak to be where you want it, uh, just expose for kind of the peak to be kind of in the center of your uh, of the dip between your peaks. Hmm. All right. Anybody else have any questions? S You should do like an all day seminar somewhere, uh, Linda. <laughs> we could. Well, I mean, uh, honestly, you know, what I know up here is thanks to the people out there in Novak because, uh, you know, the, the people in the club have just been so uh, freely giving of their time and knowledge that without that, I wouldn't have had the success that I've had. So. Uh, I should be the one thanking all of Novak because, you know, without that, I mean, this is a fantastic club to be a part of. So we'll, uh, we'll wrap up here real quick. Uh, I do want to plug again the, the need if, uh, if any of you have uh, an interest in helping us uh, with some of the volunteer needs that we, that we have, there's the, the lead for the smartphone imaging group. I'd love to find somebody to just take that and, uh, you don't even have to run wild with it. Just kind of walk the group forward would be great. Um, anyone that can help with the treasure functions that, that Paul pointed out would, would also be a tremendous help to the club. And, uh, and you know, um, help, help Alvin when you see outreach announcements. Um, take one of them. It's, it's, you'll find it uh, very rewarding um, to do. Um, so 
Uh, anybody else have any comments? I know we had several new members tonight. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, we uh, certainly welcome you in, in all the groups and all of the little niche interests that we have in the club. Reach out to any of us if you have any questions. And uh, again, thank you, Linda, for making time for us. Uh, it's always great, uh, great to hear from you. Thanks, Paul. It's an honor to be asked to speak before the group. All right, uh, that's it for tonight. We'll see you again in uh, basically 30 days. So thanks, Michael, for joining us tonight, too. Thank you, Linda. Good night, everyone. Mm -hmm. Good night, Charles. Linda.